Greetings folks, welcome back to my little corner of the library. Today on the show we're going to be discussing one of the most epic and adventurous historical novels ever written. Now like most people, my introduction to it came through the 1935 film of the same name starring Errol Flynn. It was an action-adventure movie that caught your imagination and didn't let go. But the question remained in my mind, how much of the source material was actual historical fact and how much was just window dressing? Now, my name's Dan, you're watching Bookworm History, and this is Captain Blood by Raphael Sabatini. Raphael Sabatini was born April 29, 1875, and was truly a man of the continent. His mother was British, his father Italian. Sabatini himself would go on to be educated in both Portugal and Switzerland before finally settling in Liverpool, where he worked for a local newspaper. Newspaper work, however, held no thrill for Sabatini, who was at heart a historian and a storyteller. Now, his first story was published in 1901, although it would be another 20 years before Sabatini would achieve any real commercial success, coming with the publication of his novel Scaramouche, a novel of the French Revolution, in 1921. Now, in the 20 years prior to Scaramouche's publication, Sabatini would publish both novels and short stories, as well as non-fictional historic works. He would follow up Scaramouche in 1922 with the publication of Captain Blood, his Odyssey, which could arguably be called Sabatini's most famous book. Captain Blood, the character, first saw the light of day as short stories that Sabatini published in Premier Magazine from 1920 to 1921. He would then take these stories, consolidate them, and work through a, a, a single narrative thread, and publish them as the novel Captain Blood in 1922. Some of Sabatini's earlier works, including the 1915 The Seahawk, were then pushed into reprinting to commercialize on the success of Scaramouche and Captain Blood. So who was Captain Blood? The book itself tells the story of Peter Blood, a doctor in England who gets caught up in the Monmouth Rebellion tending to one of the wounded rebels and is arrested, convicted, despite having no part in the rebellion itself, and sent to Barbados for transportation for ten years for his crimes. In Barbados, he and some other convicts manage to escape, capture a Spanish privateer, and ultimately go on to become the most feared pirate crew in all of the Spanish main. It's a fantastic story, full of action, adventure, romance, drama, everything you could ask for in a good adventure novel. But how much of it is real, and how much of it is just Sabatini making things up? Sabatini himself was a tireless researcher which went into his crafting of these individual worlds, thus placing the reader within them. Captain Blood itself uses a literary device that had been seen many times before. Washington Irving used it, uh, Miguel de Cervantes used it in Don Quixote. Sabatini actually inserts himself into the novel as the narrator, saying that he is writing this narrative using logs kept by Jeremy Pitt, who was one of the characters in the book. He was the navigator aboard the pirate ship after he and Blood escaped from Barbados. He was the one who originally summoned Blood to uh, the aid of a wounded man at the beginning of the novel, a crime for which Blood is then arrested. But where one historian is good, two are better. And Sabatini goes on to say that the logs of Jeremy Pitts from which he's working are actually the property of Mr. James Spake of Comerton. So we have this sort of found manuscript device being used, lending a sense of credibility to both the narrator and Jeremy Pitt. But how much of the events in the novel were actual historical fact, and how much is just Sabatini? Now, Sabatini based the historical background for Captain Blood primarily on two books. The first was published in 1689. It was called A Relation of the Great Sufferings and Strange Adventures of Henry Pittman, written by Dr. Henry Pittman. Now, Pittman himself was a doctor. Much like Peter Blood, he was caught up in the Monmouth Rebellion, but not because he was a soldier. Local to the area where the battle was being fought, he went down to visit the Lord of Oxford's troops and happened to lose his horse. Unable to procure a new one, he ended up staying, and after the battle helped to treat some of the wounded rebels. If that sounds familiar, it should. It's the same thing that happened to Peter Blood. Now, Pittman was arrested and stood before Judge Jeffreys at the Bloody Assizes, where many men, regardless of guilt or innocence, were condemned to die. Pittman was initially given a sentence of death, however, as a result of a work shortage in the colonies of Barbados and Jamaica, some of the plantations there were sorely in need of labor, his death sentence was commuted. He was instead sentenced to ten years of transportation. Now he, along with many others, worked on the island of Barbados on a plantation owned by a man named Bishop. If you've read Captain Blood, again, this sounds pretty darn familiar. 
Also during that time, Pittman would go and make good his escape. However, not during an attack like Peter Blood did, but rather during a night of drunken partying. You see, the governor of Barbados was hosting another governor in his mansion, and in the process, all of the troops that were guarding the mansion and the slaves got drunk and fell asleep. It was during this period that many of the slaves, Pittman included, made good their escape. They had managed to buy a small boat, escaped the island, but ultimately were shipwrecked. Later, they were picked up by English privateers, where Pittman finally was able to make his way home. Now, Sabatini even borrowed a few names from Pittman's work. Pittman, he changed to Pitt. Bishop was, in fact, the man who ran the plantation. He even used Nuthall. The man who bought the boat for Pittman and his crew was the same man who, in the book, bought a boat for Peter Blood. So much for the rebel background. What about the pirates? Sabatini took much of the pirate action, including the descriptions and the uh, cities that he worked with, directly from a work entitled The Buccaneers of America, which was a 17th century bestseller written by Alexander Escumelin. Now, he, Escumelin was a Dutch uh, chronicler who had actually sailed with Henry Morgan. Sabatini would use the Buccaneers of America, and specifically many of the actions of Henry Morgan, in crafting the adventures of Peter Blood. He even goes on at specific points to say that the uh, adventures and the praise due Morgan in fact goes in large part to the adventures and actions of Peter Blood, thus blurring the line between reality and fiction. In many ways, Blood's career serves to parallel Morgan's actual adventures, including things like the sacking of Spanish settlements or the letters of Mark from the King of England, thus uh, ensuring his actions would be protected and that he acted as a privateer rather than a pirate. A fun question that I hadn't really considered at the time I started digging into this, but one which has a very interesting answer, was where did Sabatini get the name for Peter Blood? Blood was a fairly common English surname, but is it possible that Sabatini had someone more specific in mind? He never actually said specifically where he got the name from, but it is theorized that he took it from one Thomas Blood, Colonel Thomas Blood, at least according to him although he was no more a colonel than uh, Colonel Sanders. Thomas Blood was an Irishman, and a noted troublemaker during the English reign of Charles II. He would go on to achieve somewhat lasting, if not fame, certainly infamy, in his 1671 attempt to steal the crown jewels. He almost got away with it. Uh, however, he was ultimately captured. The really fun part is that he was never convicted, or tried, or sentenced. Not only was he given a royal pardon, he was even given title to some lands in Ireland, worth about 200 pounds a year. Why was this? No one knows. Well, that's about all we've got for you today. As with all of our episodes, we really just scratched the tip of the iceberg. The amount of research that Sabatini put into this book, into crafting this world, and really all the other worlds that he, he wrote in, uh, is, is truly staggering, the amount of work that he put into these not even a, in a fictional aspect, but in a non-fictional aspect, to make this world seem real, to make these people seem like real people, and that they were moving through these historical events. I do hope you enjoyed it. If you did, be sure to hit that like button down below, give us a big thumbs up. If you have any questions, comments, uh, if you have any uh, works that you'd like to see us discuss, be, uh, be sure to leave them in the comment section down below as well. You can always find us on Twitter, at Bookworm History, uh, as well as we now have a blog, uh, bookwormhistory.wordpress.com. I'll also leave a link in the description down below. Uh, we just have some articles over there, uh, you know, the just random stories and things that don't necessarily make it into the videos, but uh, that are, you know, interesting and fun nonetheless. So be sure to check that out. But anyway, I do hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day as well. Thanks for stopping by.